Hello and welcome once again to Beyond the Game. I am Kendall Gammon, 15-year NFL veteran, and I'm joined as always by the OG of player engagement, player programs. He is Lamont Winston. Lamont, how you doing, man? Kendall, I am doing fantastic. We have another week. It's an exciting week uh, in sports. Uh, you know, you got the NBA playoffs going. Uh, but yes. the other thing is you got the NFL draft, and, and that really begins that, that kickoff for the 2022 yeah. season. So it's great. Everything's buzzing down here in Miami and Jacksonville. So, um, yeah, excited. Yeah, it, it's amazing what the draft has become. Um, of course, we're, we're taping this uh, a day before the draft starts, so April 27th. And, you know, we'll talk about it a little bit later in terms of maybe uh, my experience and some things that you've done. And, of course, we've got a great guest in Dave Zott, former Kansas City Chief and current player, uh, relations director for the New York Jets uh, and just a, a joy, a good friend of yours, a teammate of mine for a year. So that's uh, uh, good as well. But the draft was always interesting. The first day was on, the first couple rounds were on TV, but it was in New York every year. And then the NFL decided, wait a minute, we've got something that we can market greatly. And I have to give, I have to give them credit on this one. Um, they, they've done a heck of a job, in my opinion. Yeah, they've done a fantastic job, Kendall. You know, the 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 you, you, in the years that it was in New York, you know, everybody pointed in the country towards New York, and yeah, um, you know, sometimes you know people couldn't really partake in it because it was long. But I think what the league has done, they've always done a fantastic job of finding opportunities, right, to market the brand and take these take this closer to the fans. And so, to, taking it on the road, fantastic idea. Uh, I know they've and, and, and if people are excited. Uh, now people are traveling with it, right? And so yeah. with it being in Las Vegas, that is uh, just another extension of this rollout uh, of the National Football League in Las Vegas. And so, um, you know, having the Pro Bowl down there, um, you know, now you you have the draft down there. Uh, one of these days, they might have the combine down there. So yeah, um, yeah, it's it, it's really they did, they've done a fantastic job of of immersing this draft process uh, in the fans. You know, it's interesting as we tape this again, April 27th, um, I say that date on purpose. I know it kind of dates us, but the fact is 1992, April 27th, I was drafted in the 11th round by the Pittsburgh Steelers. So I don't know how many years that is, but it's to the day today that we're taping this. And I learned of it by watching the crawl on the bottom of the ESPN screen. Um, and got a call right beforehand from the Pittsburgh Steelers, spoke with uh, uh, Coach Cower, who, quite honestly, I'd never heard of. I knew he just came from Kansas City. You, of course, know him know him well. But, um, oh, man, have we come a long way to what this year, I believe, um, if memory serves me correct, the, the the people will travel to and from the stage in, in, uh, in, in Las Vegas uh, via a boat because it's there on the uh, – uh, on the water in front of the, uh, I forget which hotel, but uh, the Bellagio or the Bellagio, exactly right. So it, it, it's amazing, as you said. I mean, the NFL make. I mean, they, they want to make it a year-round sport, and they and they really have. And as I joke, they don't want the world; they just want your half. They want they want the attention all the time, and and, and I'm okay with that. That that's good. But um, there's a lot of people's. Uh, worlds that are getting to change getting ready to change right now uh some are prepared for it many are not right yeah i mean you know the reality of it is you know when you know once the you know the, the college hype is now over uh you know the testing uh is over at the combine the all-star games the the uh, uh pro days at the colleges all the talk all of that stuff is over now because yeah. tomorrow Okay, it becomes very real, right? Yeah, and and everybody's lives uh, and, and everybody uh, around them, their lives are going to change, and there's going to be some heartache. There's going to be some just crazy uh, exuberance. Um, mm -hmm. There's going to be a whole lot of fears. They, they may not admit it, but there's a whole lot of fears, and it's interesting because once you get selected, you get a chance to go. You're getting invited into a work environment that's already established by pros. And right. so where well, everybody's kind of like celebrating and you do yourself, I'm sure, but you're thinking about, man, what's going to be like when I get there? 
right? You know, because it because then it gets real. And so I yeah. think that uh, it's funny, Kendall. Nobody can help you at that point. No agent, no, no family members. When you arrive, right? It's you, it's you, right? And I know you experienced that as a rookie. Yeah. Yeah, it is. I mean, ultimately, when you get there, now you're relying on your, on your talent level. You know, coming into the draft, into the combine and everything, if you're higher picks, uh, you probably at this point in time, in, in this day and age, you have uh, some type of media team that, that's helping prepare you and how you deal with your interviews, how you deal with the coaches, what to say, what not to say. And for some people, if, if, if you think that sounds kind of odd or it's hard to believe, trust me, it is absolutely true because – you're trying, I mean, you're on a constant interview for these guys. But again, once you once you get drafted, doesn't mean you're making the squad. Certainly, if you're high draft pick, you're there. But otherwise, I mean, if you're in my position as an 11th round pick, you're scared to death. You know, I mean, for me, as I joke when I speak, it's like, okay, 11th round, I was the 291st person taken. So, you know, right away, feeling really good about myself. Uh, but um you know you at least have a chance. And confidence for NFL players is really good. But I think something, and you could probably speak to this even better than I, but it's really an insecure confidence too. I practiced incessantly out of the fear of failing. And it does get to you. I mean, it does... <laughs> it, 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 it does push you in a way that you've never been pushed before. Yeah, you know, you're, you you know, it, it is, and that, that's that's the reality. You know, um, these rookies are going to come in, and yeah. you know, uh, I know Dave's going to come on and talk about that. You know, having been in the locker room as a as a seasoned vet, and then now in his role as head of player engagement for the New York Jets, 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 Jets. But at the <laughs> end of the day, I tell all the rookies, it's like, well, guys, here's the reality: you're here. No matter how you got here, you're here. So there in life, you have a chance. Somebody yeah. in this building wanted you here. Now, can you get out of your own way enough and open your mind and self up enough to really uh, uh, hone in and learn and humble yourself, if you will, for a lot of guys, and, and, and humble yourself, Riley, to, to really learn and to be say, say, you know what? I got talent, but I had college talent. Now, 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 can I take that yeah. college talent and make that NFL uh, sustainable NFL talent? And, and, I, right. and so, you know, it, we we try to make sure that the rookies understand. Like, it's not a we don't want them all pressured up, but we want to let them know that the pressure is real. And when you do have it, right, th th there's that you have resources and support to help you through it. Because you know, uh, one of the coaches used to always say, you know, when when you get drafted. You just written your space longer. That's all, right? Yeah. And what we're seeing uh, with guys, you know, I mean, think, look at it, Kendall. I mean, now you could be a first round draft pick for someone, and in a year, maybe two, you're gone. Yeah. I mean, so yeah, they, it's you're not, exactly it's right. Not, you're, you're written that space, you know. Nobody that's that's what I always said. I mean, you're renting the space, and it, it's the best temporary job you'll ever have because yeah, it is that's temporary. The best job you ever have. And absolutely yeah. true. Absolutely. Yeah, I'm 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 going into uh Turner uh elementary school, the fifth grade, uh here in a few days. I guess it's it's in a few weeks, gonna talk to them about career day and talk about the NFL, but then talk about all the peripheral that goes around it, but just talk about understanding that that uh, there's so much that goes on with, with not just you know, the, the football side of it, but anything, there's the surrounding of everything that's looking at stuff. I'm, I'm curious because you've been in a different position than me. I mean, is it, is it fair to say, number one, that all eyes are on the rookies for sure. And they want to see at all times how they're responding to everything. And even to the degree of uh, does the, does the front office staff or the coaches, will they do some things sometimes um, just to, I mean, push something on purpose just to see how a rookie reacts or see how they're going to deal with something. Yeah. I mean, you know, it, it's, a, it, 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 you know, it, and it's all in about growth. It's not about trying to trick the guys or put them in a bad spot, but, but you right. want to see, you need as many opportunities to see uh, how these men will uh, respond in pressure situations, because when you start really getting ready for games, that's what the game is all about. 
It's a right. snap of of pressure. It's a snap of how you're going to respond. And so the, the, the more they can put you through some of those situations, long meetings, for instance. Yeah. Right? You know, you got you get you got to sit in there and there's no more classes. So there's long meetings. OK, um, yeah. uh, you know, there's 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 going to a walkthrough on, on the grass. For, for 20 minutes coming back in and going to another meeting, okay? Uh, you know, can you get to work as a rookie at 6.30, right? Yeah. And be on time yeah. every morning, right? Uh, so so there's a lot of things that, that, that go on, and I think, you know, everybody, you're right, everybody's watching. I mean, think about this. Tomorrow, all the media, they get a chance to write about something fresh now. They've been writing yeah. about you know, they can't so, wait. Yep. So, so now they got you. So all the, the you picks you're at your team, they got you now. So so you're either going to um let, you know give them something really positive to write about, right? That's going to help you, or mm-hmm. you're going to serve them up something that is going to you know really detract from your ability to focus on your job and do your job. Yeah, and, and I think. It's probably not as prevalent at the higher levels of, of the guys that have played in, in the, the, the top division one because they're playing at such a high level and they have mm-hmm. the championships and everything. But I know for the lower round picks, I mean, you're, you're coming in. I mean, me, for instance, I walk into Three River Stadium, uh, which some of people that are listening right now don't even know what that is. But that's a former Steelers stadium that, that I played my career in and. Okay, so I look over one way and I I see Rod Woodson, future Hall of Famer. And I look another way, I see Dermonte Dawson, future Hall of Famer. I look over, I I see Greg Lloyd, I I think arguably one one of the most intense and uh, violent linebackers uh, that that there was in the game. And certainly I can attest to that as, and it's another story for another time, but getting into fight with him my first day in pads at training camp, I'm like, really, are we going to do this? But I mean, you you have to fight that wow factor a little bit also, and and I remember walking in and you're 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 trying to serve up confidence in your actions and how you are, but I think if anybody says they're not intimidated going into those locker rooms, they're they've got to be lying or they're just exceptional. You know, it's interesting. I you know I I tend to believe that you know uh, uh, you know even for, for instance, you know, if you're reading about the Broncos. Like, so the Broncos yeah. now have Russell Wilson. So the veteran guys are like walking there, like I'm in the huddle with Russell Wilson. Like, yeah, like like I got to be able to, you know, you read about him, and I got, and so it's intimidating. And so when you when you get a draft pick, a rookie comes in there, and if if the coaches put you in that huddle, knowing yeah. that you only know maybe five things, right? And you go in there with a guy like Russell Wilson. Guess what's going to happen? You're, you're, you're going to be looking, we're going to look around and say, I remember I had a rookie tell me one time, I get in the huddle when I first got to the Chiefs, and he says, man, I look around, and I see Joe Montana. Yeah. I'm in the huddle now. You only got so much time in the huddle. And I see Marcus <laughs> Allen, right? And I'm sitting here saying, I, I, I see John All, right? I, I got I got Tim Grunhart. I got what You're like, wow. And then Freddie Bray. So now you got to go yeah. to the line of scrimmage, right? And then go out there. So, so there's a lot of those scenarios. But I think even the guys from the big schools can can, can do us the same thing, man. Like, you know, you you, you it, all the, the the SEC, the Pac-12, the Big Ten. When you get to a pro team, it is another level, and I don't think anybody right. would refute that if they're being honest. Yep. Now let, let me ask you because you. You were on the player engage. You were a coach when you came to Kansas City, but you were on the player engagement, player program side of things. Also, were you in the draft room, and would they turn to you every once in a while? Would they would they ask you to refresh them on the character of an individual, perhaps? Sure, absolutely, and I know Dave. Uh, Dave will speak to that as well. Um, <clears throat> you know, I came in as a scout, so you know, my I had scouting reports, and I had yeah. to do that right, and so, but. You know, when you get when as we as as we got more involved in kind of the background of personal players, absolutely. You know, it's like let me hear where are we at with so so. Tell me, walk th- through us with this one more time. And you know, at the end of the day, they wanted to know. Mr. Peterson wanted to know. The head coach wanted to know. All right, Lamar wanted. To know, do we have a plan for this player? 
Okay. Right? And, and, and yes, we do. And we walk through the plan. So every now and then, yeah, they turn around, Lamont, give us the thoughts, give us, you know, recap us real quick. Okay, we got this. Okay, we've had we've had these discussions. Okay, so now what's the plan again? You walk through the plan again. Everybody feels good. And they become a chief. Yeah, it's just that easy. easy. I wish it was just that easy. Take, take our listeners into it also in terms of, I mean, the, the board up there, the grades and however they do that. But the fact is, there's not a person being drafted that seems like, oh, we didn't know anything about him. I mean, you've got every single name up there, right? Hundreds. I learned, I learned, I learned from, a, from, from, from some veteran scouts, like, you know, there are no, there are no hidden gems. There right. are people that didn't do their job. And you know that that right. didn't go the extra and to find out about this particular player, but there's no hidden there's no hidden gems. You know what's really crazy is that you know they they get the board set and you have another whole separate board that's a priority yep. free agent board. So that's the right. that's the second draft sort of speak yeah. process that happens immediately after the draft, right? Um, and so people don't really know about that board. There's there's a priority for agents. And then there's free agents, right? But on this yeah. board over here, and those they give you color coded dots that mean certain things: medical, character, you know, all these different alcohol. It, it's a lot of different things. Yeah, you you see guys' names up there that were first round grades, and then they're now you're the third round. When you look at the board, you're like, okay, these, these two guys up here that first round grades were in the third round. Obviously, they got issues, things that you know kind of scaring teams yeah. away. But then, you know, you're sitting there, you're like, man, all this talent, this first round talents there. Can we get to the fourth round? Well, well, you know, people go through it and they say, well, OK, if that if, if Lamont's there at the fourth fourth round with that first round grade, top 10, maybe first. Right. Round grade, that's when you see teams take those shots. Right. Because yeah. they think, because monetarily, you know, it outweighs the risk, maybe. Uh, 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 if it's a medical, you got your medical staff saying, you know, yep, we can we can deal with it at this level. So yeah. it really is interesting, man. Um, and you have guys that I know. Uh, uh, there's some teams I know. Uh, one of my former teams, the Raiders, were kind of known. They, you see, a guy that was in the fifth round, and he's taken in the second round. <laughs> like, yeah. who's where he come from? How do he shoot up the board? But it's really all how people see the players after they've done the work. Um, and, and so it, it's, it's definitely not an exact science for sure, but um, uh, yeah, it's, um, it, it's, a, it's an ongoing process much later than you just kind of right after the seventh last player in the seventh round. Yeah, you're exactly right. Okay. Well, you're talking about your experiences and we're going to bring somebody in now, Dave Zott, and he's going to tell us about his experiences. Dave was a 14 year uh, NFL veteran guard, um, an all pro one year, uh, I think maybe all rookie, uh, just did a lot of different things at a high level, especially for somebody being a lower round draft pick. Um, and uh, he was a teammate of mine for one year, even though he, that was an injury plagued year for him for with that. So with that, we're going to bring in Dave Zott. Zotter, how we doing? Doing great. Doing great. It's a beautiful day here in Florham Park, New Jersey. And, uh, <clears throat> Spring has arrived finally. It was a long winter, boys, but uh, mm -hmm. it is here, and, and it's a it's a very obviously important week. It dominates the news, even though we're in the off season. It's really incredible to me how the NBA finals are going on, but the lead stories are the NFL. You know, and uh, it, 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 it's for Russ. It was a great business to be involved with, and um, still be involved with. Because you have the NBA, some of the world's greatest athletes, they're in the middle of, of their pursuit at a world championship, but the draft and who's picking and who's moving up and all the scenarios, uh, that dominates the lead story. So it's it's an incredible game and um, we celebrate 102 years, I believe, of this game now and uh, it's been a great run. Well, you know, Dave, uh, you know, again, our, our path started together in 93 when I came to the Chiefs. Um, uh, it was a very, uh, as coming from, uh, from as a college, college coach, but then coming in as a scout, and you really ca came in there and you started looking at this this vaunted offensive line, you, had, you know, the coaches, Marty, the Jimmy Rays, the, the all of these different, you know, 
uh, the different coaches and you look at the players and you're like, wow. And I know back then um, it was the same thing as now, right? You get drafted, sure. you're ready for the draft, but then you have to show up from wherever you come from. You show up in Kent at your team and then it's go time, right? Correct. And just a hi historical, I was a history poli sci major at Penn State. So I love the history. I bore my wife with the facts all the time. But when I got drafted in 1990, there was not this role that I was fortunate to have Lamont Winston in. And then I actually had his brother here with the Jets, Kevin, when I came here. Uh, but when I showed up in 1990, literally the first person I met in the building was Mike Webster, the all-time great. Oh, man. Wow. And, and you showed up and you tried to figure it out. You know, uh, Howard Mudd, the late, great Howard Mudd, an offensive line coach who among the people that know was one of the greatest technicians yeah. uh, as an offensive line coach this game has ever seen. And I was fortunate enough to have him to teach me because I, I was not as skilled or my technique wasn't not close to what it needed to be when I showed up. But things like life decisions. I remember my parents calling me, uh, do you have insurance? I said, I don't know. I don't know if I have insurance. <laughs> so. Like I literally went upstairs and on the fifth floor where we got paid was a gal who did payroll and she did insurance. She gave me some forms and like you need to help figure it out because every other job I'd had before then was, you know, under the table cash kind of deals. So, um, yeah, all these things. And, and for our listeners, that didn't I, Lamont's role, my role didn't exist. Now we take all these guys through these things and 90 percent of our players. This is their first job. Uh, they've never received a W-2 or an I, you know, a 1099. They're starting to, some of the top guys with the NILs, which is a really hot topic, right, which just came into yep. the world, which, which I'm all for because some of these guys have some financial experience before they show up here. They may, I, all, all our pre-drive visits, I'm like, did you have an NIL? Then you, you really need to be filing taxes here in about a week for the first time. Right. So um, – <clears throat> All these things, this life experience, they haven't really achieved. They've never really had any in, uh, internships in the summer because, as you know, guys, they were up on campus working out, yep. trying to stay on pace to graduate, taking summer classes. So all their peers on campus have taken two or three internships in the summer. Um, they never did. So they never received any income. There was never any tax consequence because of that. So it's just they're very, very skilled and very, very focused in one skill set. Um, and we need to kind of broaden their skill set a little bit because, you know, the real world's knocking on their door for uh, the first time in a lot of areas. Dave, as you look back, um, coming from a big program in, in, in Penn State, uh, number one, did you go to the combine? I didn't know where you were at with that one. Then number two, um, can you take us back to, to maybe your draft day or, or even the days preceding and, and what was going on in your head? Sure. So, Kendall, I was fortunate to be part of a national championship team at Penn State. Um, we, we had a tremendous amount of talent, obviously. I played my freshman year, didn't start, but played. Um, and then I actually won the starting guard job that spring, came back in the fall, and we had had a bunch of defensive line graduate. So Joe asked me, Joe Paterno, the late Joe Paterno, asked me to move over to defense. So I, I went from guard to D tackle, played there wow. my sophomore year, and then I moved to nose guard my junior year, and then back to offense my senior year. Wow. So I did a lot of moving, and I started all those positions, uh, but it didn't really help me on the draft board come, come right. April. So uh, I, I always say to people, you know, when I get calls for donations at Penn State, I said I donated when I moved around all those times because I was hot. <laughs> <laughs> because, guys, uh, I, you know, I was a highly recruited guy in college. I mean, high school, you know, uh, had a tremendous amount of offers, wrestling or football. I go to Penn State, didn't really earn anything, and then I end up fortunate enough to be all pro in the pros. What happened in those four years at Penn State, you know? I got moved around a lot. So when it came to draft day, you know, uh, it was different back then. Uh, I wasn't so promoted, didn't have so many guys there. Um, I had some people predict I was a second round talent all the way down to, you know, late round talent. Back then it was 12 rounds. Yeah. So Yeah. 28 teams, not 32, 28 right. teams, 12 rounds. 
Um, so I didn't get picked the first day. And back then they did multiple rounds on the first day. And then, they, you know, they kind of just kept going. So I didn't get in the first day I got picked. I said, well, I better finish, finish graduate. I don't know what this is going to happen. You know, I was working toward graduating and uh, I got picked, fortunate to get picked in the seventh round. Um, I was at invited to the senior bowl. I was a combine guy, uh, Kendall. I did fairly well at the combine. Some of those, you know, measurables, I guess yep. I did well enough in. I, I was at the senior bowl. The staff that coached us at the senior bowl was the Kansas City Chief staff. Mm -hmm. And um, so Carl Peterson and Marty and, you know, the group uh, must have I must have done something enough well to catch their eye to take a chance. I mean, the seventh round. So 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 Dave, so so that's interesting. So, you know, we were, Ken and I were talking about just like that mindset sometimes, you know, like you you leading up to the draft, you know, the, the combine and your know, all star game combine, the, the profit, you know, the 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 uh, pro the colleges. Your situation, you know, you played offensive line. You played two years high level at defensive line. You played your senior year. So when you get drafted by the Chiefs in the seventh round, what was going through your mind? Was it like, I got this, or I'm going to Kansas City, and when I get there, were you like, okay, can I – I haven't really – you see Mike Webster, a polished – a Hall of Famer. I mean, where, where sure. was your confidence level? <laughs> low, low. <laughs> low. I remember. Now, you got to understand, in my family, I had one brother who played center, and he used to burst out of the huddle and run to the line just like Webby did. And he had his art, you know, he had his jersey all taped up, and he was piped up, and he thought he was Mike Webster. So when I saw this guy, I was like, oh, my goodness. And he introduced himself to me and said, Dave, great to have you here. And and a little history lesson, Mike came to the Chiefs to be a coach. We had a, Apparently, there's an injury there before, and he said, I could still play. So he put, went back in the room, put his pants wow. on. Yeah. Wow. Oh, yeah. And played two more years. That's why they drafted Grunny to take, wow. take his position the next year. So uh, I was – my confidence, you know, confidence was low. And then we go to uh, training camp back there. was at Liberty, north of the city. William Jewell College. I never felt heat and humidity like that in my life. Um, double sessions pads. First practice started at like 9.30 or something, 9.30-ish, quarter to 10 maybe, or yeah, probably 9, 9.30. And the second practice started at 2 o'clock, and that heat would be shivering off that field, grass field, still shivering. I was like, oh, my goodness. And then we'd stretch, and we used to have to run to this lower field at William Jewell. The old, all the big guys had to jog down there, and Webby was gone. Webby was like leading the pack, sprinting. And I remember talking to my older brothers, you know, about a week in the camp. They said, how's it going? I go, I said, I don't know. I said, I'm not getting any reps. I'm, I'm fighting. I'm getting one-on-ones. I'm not getting any reps. We had 17 offensive linemen in camp. And back then on a 47-man roster, you're only keeping seven. No practice squad, guys. Right. No peace squad. Yeah. So you either made it or you didn't, you know. I said, I don't know. I said, I don't know what's going to happen. I, I know one thing. I, this guy, Webster, I can't even keep up with this 17-year vet. He runs everywhere, and I'm exhausted. So, uh, yeah, my, my confidence was low, and then we played a fifth preseason game. Our first preseason game was in Berlin, Germany, uh, hmm. and we played the, the Rams at the time, you know, the um, Anaheim Rams out there, and L.A. Rams, and uh, – I played a lot. They basically, the starter started, they pulled us all off and they threw a bunch of us out there. And that was kind of the start of my opportunity. You know, I did enough. I didn't even really have any reps in practice. I was just flying around. Um, and then I slowly got more and more time, you know, but it was, it was tough. And there wasn't guys like Lamont in your corner kind of pulling on, you know, with a encouraging you. It was staffs were smaller. Um, it, it was a different time. Yeah. Yeah. Hey, Lamont, I want to ask you uh, mm -hmm. real quick. I mean, you saw Dave come in. So th this is kind of a unique situation we have. Can, can you remember what you saw in him and and talking with him or I mean, and whatnot? I'm just curious if there's any memories that the things that get jarred when you see Dave. You know, it, 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 it Dave was already, I came in 93, and like I said, I had came from uh, University of Oh, Nevada. he was already there. That's right. As, as a football coach. 
But the thing about it was, and, and that's one of the reasons I think, you know, that, that I was one of the Chiefs, you know, wanted hired me as a coach, excuse me, as a scout because of that coaching background. But you get to Kansas City and and you look at the as a running back guy, it's easy to look at the run. I looked at the offensive line and I'm looking at these guys like I did my little homework. I'm kind of reading, and it was it was like wow, it was really like a wow, right? And then in '93, uh, we got Marcus Allen. <laughs> I'm sitting here like, and Joe Montana, and I'm watching these guys and the, if, how they worked. I know a uh, Will Shields is a great friend of ours, all of mm-hmm. ours, um, and he was a rookie, right? But it was amazing how you watch Dave. I'll never forget. It was really the left side. It was it was Grunny, Dave, and John Alt. And when you talk about toughness, we would go back and look at tape, and it was just crazy. I used to I tell Dave all the time. I used to love, love watching Dave pull because somebody was getting ready to get rolled, and it was all the time, like really all the time. So you know, as I watched those guys, I told myself in this locker room, when I started doing the player programs thing. It was you know what. Uh, I, I got to be on point because you don't want to piss those guys off, right? You need to be right doing what you're doing. And I know Dave, uh, they just say welcome to me. They were pros. Um, and they really ran the locker room, the offensive line group did. Like they, they that, that was my, and Dave was an enforcer. And he may not say, but he was an enforcer. For real. It's different times, different times, <laughs> different mindset. <laughs> different mindset. Well, I, there's a right way to do things, guys, and you got to be completely yeah. committed. And, and I, it was tough for that group. And I say thank you, Lamont. But, you know, I had a wrestling kind of mentality and, uh, you know, the, where I grew up in North Jersey and, you know, the mindset we had, and, and you know, coming from a big program, we had to fight and scratch to get on the field. And so there was a standard that was set. And, and Will came, it was arguably the most talented out of that group. He came in as a rookie and really – you know, fortified that. And when you're going to take that kind of mindset and you go down an alley, you want to have someone with you. And we had a bunch of dudes with us and wherever challenge was ahead of it, didn't matter. We're going out to that godforsaken place in Oakland to go play. <laughs> yeah. All those guys, I don't know what they're thinking, how they dress like that. You know, uh, yeah, I don't know. it's Halloween every Sunday out there. You know, they all, they all come out, but um that that mindset was fortunate, and it started with guys like Dave Lutz and Richard Baldinger and Alt when we were there, and then you know Grunny and I, and then Will later grew up in that, and we just took on that mindset and, and replicated it, and we tried to hand it down when we left. You know, the greatest thing to do is to kind of you know leave that um, that DNA and that continued tone and attitude and approach to the game when you leave. So, it was, you know, I'm as excited as anyone to see, you know, obviously I work with the Jets and I'm, <clears throat> they're my number one team, but number two is Kansas City. Still want to see them be successful. Um, and uh, it's great to see them continue with, to see what they're doing. So, Dave, Dave look, oh, so, go ahead. So, Dave, so tell our listeners, let's kind of back it up a little bit. And, and in your role as head of player engagement, um, yeah. behind the scenes, what have you been doing the last few months? And then, really fast forward to what you've been doing like um, the last maybe two weeks. Sure. So we start, um, we was, I was at the combine, Fort Jeff go to the combine, spend a lot of time there with potential draft picks. Uh, we go through an interview process and I don't evaluate film. I tell them that when I come in, I don't watch a snap. We have plenty of people in the building. That's what they do. I just want to get a feel for your personality of character. And you're going to fit in this locker room. So interviewed, spent six days in Indy, uh, interviewed almost 70 guys there. And then then we have wow. the pre-draft visits. Each club is allowed to bring in uh, 30 draft picks before, you know, before the draft in person in the building. And uh, it's fortunate to be part of that role. So it's a lot of time evaluating, I write my evaluation. And then it goes up to the guys with uh, a lot more authority and and a bigger you know, pay, payroll than me, you know, uh, to make the decision, which is going to start tomorrow. So, so Dave, let me ask you, let me ask this question. So, you know, tell our listeners how it feels when you're in a meeting or you're in meetings and, you know, coach are talking about various players and then you have to come in with 
they're talking about the athletic talent and they're dancing around yeah. some things. But you have to come in and say what the real deal is, right? <laughs> yeah. Least of how that, how, how that, how that it's probably not popular very often either. No, it's not. I, I, I've said to my wife and uh, I'm probably going to get fired today, you know, so because you got to be you got to be true to yourself. Like if this is yeah. your instinct and this is what this is telling you about this individual. There, a lot of guys are talented, but to me, it's the, the mindset. Do they love football? Are they going to sacrifice all the things that need to be sacrificed to become the player we need them to be? Is football their priority? You know, are they tough enough? Are they smart enough? And especially in a market like New York, where there's a lot of distractions, a lot of places they can go, a lot of things to do, um, is football first? And have they proved that in the past? Even if they've made mistakes, right? We've all made mistakes. I made plenty of mistakes. My wife tells me I make them every day, right? So, but <laughs> big mistakes, you know, um, did they learn from them? And, and is that something, you, you know, talk to me about that issue that occurred at some point in college, what, what have you. Did they learn from it? Did they repeat it? You know, you don't want to have those distractions. We've all been in those locker rooms where something's going on and that's everyone's talking about it. What happened with this guy? And everyone's focused and it just deters from the ability to win football games and, and be successful. So, uh, yeah, sometimes because I, I don't I cannot look at the talent, guys. That's why I don't do it, because I could be sucked that into it as well. This guy, you know, I just focus on what I believe, how he will contribute to this team and what kind of person and character he has. Hey, David, could you talk to the listeners in terms of I think many people listening, watching would be like, OK, this dude played 14 years. He was an all pro. He, he surely made some decent money and whatever. Yet he's decided to get back into this side of it. What what drove you to, to do what you're doing now and being part of the player engagement for the Jets? You know, Kendall, it's a great question. I've had a couple of rookies. I always close my meeting with them, these pre-draft visits. Do they have any questions for me? And I had one young man say, how did you get in your role that you did? Oh, um, it was a great question. So I never really pursued it. I was always a guy that tried to mentor people. Um, I tried to help young guys, <clears throat> young offensive linemen, the, the, the next seventh round pick guard or tackle or center, or try to mentor them, spend time with them after practice, bring them home to dinner, you know. And I just had that kind of, you know, mentorship, serve at heart. And I think that's what the organization eventually saw in me to offer me this role. I, I, when I retired after 14 years, um, they wanted me to come back for 15, but I was done. <laughs> I knew I was, I was, yeah. I was tired. I was tired. I was 36 years old. I had enough. So I coached for two years. Um, for our listeners in the Kansas City market, you know, they're well aware, or maybe, you know, new listeners. Uh, I have a special needs son, my oldest boy, special needs. So the coaching path as a second career was not a viable one for me because you have to jump around right. a lot. Um, but my son was in a great school. That's why I left Kansas City. Um, they had great resources up to about six, seven years old. And then back here, there was a lot of great opportunities for him. So um, I coached for two years and then we had a coaching change and I, they asked me to serve as chaplain. So I served for two years as our team chaplain. And when the team, the team was still in Long Island. So I was living in Morristown, New Jersey, driving hundred and you know, uh, 72 miles, which doesn't sound like a lot, but my record is four hours from door to door because GW Bridge, Cross Bronx Expressway, you know, wow. all that kind of stuff to go do a Bible study with the guys and spend time with them and minister to them. And then um, the team moved to Florida Park, seven miles from where I've been living the whole time. And they asked me to come into this role. So uh, it's just, I, for two years, I, I served. And when I moved over, that was right in my backyard. So they asked me to continue to stay on. I'm going on my 14th season in this role. So uh, it's been a great, it's been a great, a great uh, second career, which I didn't really anticipate coming, but I love it. Cause I guys, I get to serve the whole roster, you know, sure, yeah, sure. from, from the, the starting quarterback, first round pick all the way to the, you know, the practice squad guy who's trying to stay on and, and make the club. I serve all of them and I treat them all the same. Dave, what's your number one? He rookie with tomorrow or oh, this starting tomorrow in, the, in a couple of days after, you know, uh, when they wrap this thing up, you're going to have about between draft picks, 
free agents, you're probably going to have about 25 guys mm -hmm. that's going to come to New York. What is the number one thing you're going to share with that room? Well, the number one, I have to, I have to create trust at some point. And, and over yeah. the course of, I'll have Lamont and, and Kevin, I'll have them every day for an hour. I have, the, I have them the last portion of the day for an hour. And we're going to cover a myriad of, of topics <clears throat> all over the, you know, we have programming we've played out. We have mandatory things we have to do that the league asks. But I'm trying to build trust and build a relationship with them. Um, really, the number one thing in their first year is time management. Mm -hmm. Once they, they have no more classes and no more finals, there's no more papers. Uh, all it is is football. But a lot of times they, they think they know how to study film and, and they think they know how to prepare as a pro, but they're just learning those things. Um, as I got, you know, we used to have a, a meeting every Wednesday. We would stay late and do the blitz reel. And we'd have the, the running backs in there, the tight ends in there, everyone involved on offense that had to do with the blitz. And we would spend extra time as a unit together communicating, you know, when, when we motioned and they rotated the linebackers and now the guy's off, you know, the wheel's now on the edge. He was stacked, talking to Marcus, talking to Kimball Anders, talking to guys about what their sight adjust is on this blitz. Um, a lot of young guys, once practice is over and the mandatory stuff's done, they're out to, they want to roll past the security gate and go home. And once they're home, majority of the time that iPad's not going on. There's some real disciplined guys that they are. But we emphasize, hey, take an extra half an hour, spend extra time, find a veteran that would mentor you, um, show you how to break down film. You know, even at the great, you know, big programs, uh, power five schools, um, they probably weren't challenged in those games as much as they're going to get challenged every day in practice and every time on Sunday. So those little things they learn, those little cues, uh, little reads will help them so much in getting them ramped up and be able to compete every every week uh, it's the little things that really uh, help them be successful but the time management piece you know they want to go home and get on the game you know yeah yeah and that's okay to relax if they need that portion mm -hmm. just take another half hour here so when you're sitting in that locker on sunday morning and you have anxiety because you're gonna go, you're gonna go play some stud hey i spent another two hours in the building this week getting prepared you know I believe I'm really, I like my game plan today. I like how I'm going to set them. I'm liking how my cues, my reads, what have you. Um, just learning that, the time management, building confidence and learning how to prepare as a pro. Mm -hmm. So so then with that, that so that's the number one, the time management is huge and, and, it, and it's at the top. Now, what's that, what's, that, what's that number one thing you're going to tell them about family and friends now that they're for, for, yeah. for you know, the, the foreseeable future, they're J E T at Jet Jet Jets. So what are you gonna tell them about? Because that family and friends, that's that's getting into that personal kind of uh, but you gotta say it. What, what's Dave's not gonna tell them about family and friends? Everyone in their life, and you and trust me, no one got to this place or this opportunity without a lot of help. A lot, a lot of help, a lot of God given ability that was put into your body and your DNA, but a lot of people people helped you along the way. And those people closest to you that mean that much to you. I mean, there's people you want to help and support, but there's also those givers and takers in this world. And you can't have too many takers that are continuing pulling on you, distracting you. If you have to change your phone number, uh, if you need a no person in your life, I do it. I do it very well. Um, but I know as a 22, 23 year old guy, I didn't do it well. I said yes to everything because I didn't want to tell people something they didn't want to hear. You know, written on my board up here, we're going to spend a lot of time in conflict training, like how to have these tough conversations with people. Now, they're not going to want to hear what you have to tell them, but you know, I'm spending 10, 11 hours in the building preparing myself between, you know, post practice uh, region in the tubs and, you know, all the things in the training room. And uh, I don't have a whole lot of time. You know, and they're going to want to come to New York to see you play. They expect you. I tell them on Saturdays before you get to the hotel, you don't, you can't be running around via sightseeing. Right. Set, right. Give them a map. Give them a map. <laughs> Go get on that double decker bus that everyone else drives yeah. around on. Okay, okay, <laughs> mom and dad, enjoy yourself. Go get them a tour guide. But that's not you. You know, you got to stay here 
and pour your be able to pour everything you have out onto that game on Sunday. Um, because I've you see it happen, they try to be too much to too many people, too many people, and it wears them out, wears them out. Yeah. So so last the my, let me let me have one more question here. So okay, so we're talking about the rookies. And obviously, listeners, Dave's Dave's, you know, they, they they're gonna be dropped off in his office. Trust me, that's gonna be that. But then you have a you have a you have a number of veterans now. And so for veterans, they've already made the team. But tell our listeners what you're doing for those men uh, again, because they're not rookies and you're not necessarily needing to help them with the football piece, but what are you doing with your veteran population now during during this time? Yeah, Lamont, that changes every year with free agency and and future signings, the futures, the guys who get signed in January right after the season. Then you have free agency in March. So we have six free agents we signed. I'm building I gotta build a relationship and trust with them as well. But to your point, we have a slate of veteran education that started last week with our onboarding. New, all our new players, we did an onboarding session. They got to meet personally the payroll person, the ticket person, mm -hmm. to help them with the, get them signed up with any insurance changes, all those things. Now I'm always coming to me for everything. Okay, you can go to payroll if you got to talk to someone about uh, how much you, how many tickets you had last week or what have you. Uh, but that, that was last week. We have a financial class. In fact, today, uh, gentleman Patrick Kearney, former NFL Defense Player of the yeah, Year. Sure, absolutely. Uh, he's coming to speak about his approach to finances as a player. He's a guy that uh, was a UVA undergrad, first round pick, signed a big free agent deal, NFL Defense Player of the Year. And then when he when he was done after 12 years, he went to Columbia University and he got his MBA. So I call it the my title for this session is the former NFL Defense Player of the Year with an Ivy League MBA. How many people have that? on their resume yeah uh, probably yeah. one but i know of one guy yeah. he's a tremendous man oh he's a great man his approach yeah. it's very sound and it gets guys thinking i've had him in before so i have veterans uh that's this uh that's today next week i have um a tax firm coming in talking about taxes and and how it affects a professional athlete and withholdings and all, you know we're in a state where we're prog we're all progressive tax states but we're you know, we have a higher tax rate than most other states. <clears throat> then I conclude um, another one about family. Uh, have some family attorneys coming in in a few weeks to talk about all the all the dynamics when it comes to, mm -hmm. um, you know, cohabitation and paternity and prenuptials and all those yeah. type of things. All those conversations. So I have like a veteran slate of programming, and then I roll right into uh, the. After the week after that, right into all my rookies every every day, and I have some speakers that are, are very interesting topics, uh, very interesting people, and I always make that available to our vets if they want to come sit in sure. anytime. They're able, they're uh, able to come. Uh, we welcome them. Dave, I'm curious, and this actually kind of goes to you a little bit, uh, Lamont, also. But but Dave. So last week or our last uh, session, we had Michael Bennett on, and uh, we talked about some really personal things. I always. People ask me a lot of things about the NFL when I when I speak and I always say, listen, the NFL is a violent game and violent people don't grow up in Beverly Hills. They they generally grow up in violent places and they have issues. And I, for one, I know I certainly could have used um, counseling much earlier than in my life than I got it. Michael Bennett talked about some things last week, uh, which was just incredibly vulnerable and kudos to him for handling that. But I mean, do you, Dave, and even to you, Lamont, I mean, do you guys train in trying to recognize some of these more internal problems that that may not end up surfacing till uh, later on in their life? But but sometimes if you can get a hold of them earlier, uh, how do you go about that? Do you have any training in uh, on that? Is that something that you will go to players with as well? Dave, you want to take it and I'll come back? Yeah, sure. Um we are trained in kind of the keys and the alerts and the signals, um, especially that's how why you have to get to know them because if you see their, yeah. their behavior change, uh, position coaches, their teammates, uh, their per significant others in their inner circle, you know, it's one reason I get to know the families, the, their wives, their girlfriends. Uh, but yes, we're fortunate. What I've seen, and Kendall, to your point, um, we have a team clinician. He's fantastic. And I tell in front of the whole roster, I go, I see him. I speak to him. I don't have all the answers 
to the to the questions of life and the situations that I come across. I go to him for counsel. And the greatest growth I've seen in this league over the 30 years I've been in it is in mental health and mental health resources. Mm -hmm. I just they just came out with a with a, it's actually a two pager. It's, there's so many resources available to our players. It's on two pages front and back. Six different you know distinct uh, avenues. You know, whether it be through the Cigna, their insurance <laughs> provider, through the on you know on-site clinician, which we have five days a week in the building, the and the, the trust, which is a branch of NFL NFLPA. I mean, it goes on and on and on. NFL Lifeline, which is a twenty-four-seven, you know, one-eight hundred number if you want to just call in. And these are open not just to them, but to their families, anyone in our yeah. household. It's an amazing resource. So. Yes, we've seen, and what I'm very excited about is the players who are the forerunners who said, I have an issue and I want to talk mm -hmm. about it. And we've had those guys in the league and we had one in our building years ago, Brandon Marshall, fantastic advocate for mental health and mental health resources. And he's been very, very um, open about that. And that helps other guys speak about it. Mm -hmm. I, sh I sh would have benefited from it earlier in my career and I, it really wasn't as available. And it was, you know, my immaturity probably looking at it uh, the way I should have. But now it's prevalent. It's around. It's in the building. You can call someone. You can go through the insurance provider. It's everywhere. And, you know, the nation is one in five in our country as a mental health, you know, concern yeah. of some level. You know, we've seen a lot of anxiety. Come <clears throat> I don't know if it's COVID or but more anxious, you know, anxiousness in our, in our culture and in, in our young men coming in the building now. So um, I'm very, very uh, excited um, and I'm thankful for how the league has taken the approach and the amount of resources they put in into mental health. You know, Kendall, Dave talked about, you know, we, uh, and people in, in this role, um, you know, it's, it's a couple of things. One, we get information, and I think they would agree. That information and personal is really powerful. They, they, there was mm -hmm. a time when you could talk about, you know, a guy's family or a guy drank and you know, he's a good old dude and, you know, and all that. But the, you, it, and it would just go right out the door because they really wanted to tell them. But what's happened is when we get information, we can now really dig into the information. Um, we have the clinical resources around us. And so when there's questions to be asked, you know, it's not leaning on our own understanding, right? We have, right. We, have, we have experts to help us. But the one thing I think that's unique about every person in this role with these teams is that um, we're, we're able to show our, these young men what doesn't fit in the National Football League mm -hmm. and that each of them have certain things that don't fit. And we help them identify those things that don't fit because the thing, if they – if they continue to bring things to the league in this environment that don't fit, there's going to be a, there's going to be issues, right? And right. so, a lot of times, these young men don't know, right, what doesn't fit in the multi-billion-dollar industry side of the National Football League, and we're there to help them, right? Um, we spoke about um, it being okay. You know, it's interesting because when people in, in Dave Roll. Um, you know, when, when they, he's normalized his cl clinician, it's part of the process, right? The clinician that's there, you know, five days a week, normalized. When I started yeah. at, in 94, you know, uh, we had our clinician, Betsy Klein, but it was really the, the, the environment wasn't like she was normalized. Everybody knew, right. who, knew who she was, but I'm not going by her, right? You can be Correct. torn up inside, but I'm not going by here. But I think now, and things have become more transparent. I think we've we've had incidences in the country in our social fabric that's that that's kind of really brought this out in front. And it's okay when you're seeing professional athletes say, you know, I'm not doing well, right? Sure. Yeah. And people are looking at them no longer like, oh, okay, well, something's wrong. You know, it's what do you need? And, and so people are running to them. So. Um, I think we've we've been we've been we've been constantly getting trained. I think we get trained a lot of it is by the experiences of the players that 
you know, that that we end up dealing with, because some of this stuff, David, and, and again, you're in you're in New York. I mean, some of this stuff you can't prepare for. It no, happens. No. It happens. It happens. I've never been around it myself. Yeah. Um, I've seen just about everything now. It's not yeah. the time I've yeah. everything now. I've seen it all. But to your point, Lamont, and again, I went through a very trying time as a young player. Uh, in 1995, we had a great football team. We had five couples that were all having children on the team. My wife and I had our first child, and everyone else was smiling and having a great time. We were really struggling. Mm. Fast forward to where we had we had the, we were the number one team in the AFC at the time. The Dallas Cowboys were the number one team in the NFC. We we're going to go play on Thanksgiving Day down in Dallas. It's a game I look forward to all year. But that week, three days before that game, we had taken my son to a specialist at Children's Mercy, and he said, your son will never walk, he'll never talk, he'll never be an independent living adult. Mm -hmm. All right? In the midst of the season. And my wife became very emotional, obviously. I'm trying to be the rock. I got to go get on a plane and go play Dallas on Thanksgiving right. Day. I did not play very well, okay? Um I could have, I should have went immediately to Betsy Klein mm -hmm. and sat down and talked to her. Um, and now guys are more open. I should have been more vulnerable about it. I kept, I don't know who I told. I didn't tell anybody for a while. You know, I should have been more vulnerable, but I was 26 years old. You know, sure. Didn't know how to handle all that at the time. So to your point, um, to normalize it at the time, Betsy was around or, you know, yeah. when, when people had an issue right away. Now normalize it. Our clinicians are here all the time. Him and his his staff are around all the time. They see everybody talking to him. Right. We're out of practice. It's normal. Exactly it's normal. right. It's normal to have issues. Yes. Okay? Right. We all have them. So I could have really benefited from it in '95, and uh, and then they've just built. Um, like I said, the league has just taken such a great approach to this, sure. and the union. And the union, give them their their mm -hmm. as well. But they have so much more aspects to mental health, and this is part of growing up as a man, right? All these challenges we have. These guys have never the homes they've grown up, the environments they were in. These are all different steps they have to take along the way. And I, all of a sudden, their thrust is to be the the leader in the house only because the league says they have talent enough to play the game. Okay, and they right. got the money. And they got the money. Meanwhile, they're they're 21 years old. Yeah. Some of them are 20 because they're coming out as juniors, and everyone's looking up to them. They're not nearly prepared to have those True. to have that voice and that stance in the family. They still want to be the son, you know, and have the father go to their father for for questions and advice and direction. So it's a lot um, for a young man to go through, you know, all at once. Yeah. Hey, Dave, I know we've, we've reached our limit. Um, it's been a great time today. I really appreciate uh, you coming on. Um, you know, obviously, haven't known you since I played the one year with you in Kansas City, my first year, your last there, I think. But uh, thanks so much for coming on today. Guys, thanks for ask, having me. It's great seeing you. Uh, and I love to see the, the last episode you sent me. It was fantastic. Dave, I, I, you know, I, you've, you've, you've always been, like I said, you know, a beacon for me. And I, and I just watched how, you know, Grooney, Grooney and, and Will, I mean, it's just that, that you, man, I just, and, but it's how, it's how you carried yourself as a pro uh, and as a father, as a man of Christ. Um, and it, it, in my early development in, in player development, you know, it was like, okay, this is why I tell the truth. This is why I'm honest because it's men like you, Dave, that you know, I and, and quietly, I, I'm I'm admiring, and 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 you are my benchmark. So um, there's no secret, no surprise that you're doing this role. God made it for you, and mm -hmm. and you're doing a phenomenal job. And we wish you all the best uh, with your uh, new uh, family members. <laughs> they're all coming. They don't know it yet, but they're coming. <laughs> they don't know yet. <laughs> don't know yet. But to your point, I, I approach this with a servant heart of Christ, and that's how I. That's, I, they, guys come over for dinner. They, I take them fishing. I do, but I'm pouring into their life. And what other? It's a fantastic role to be able to do that every day. You know. Well, you're doing All right. Well. Thanks, Dave. Appreciate it so much. Thanks, guys.
Take care. Speak to you, Dave. Talk to you soon. Appreciate it. Take care. Bye-bye. Man, Lamont, um, just, just a solid guy. You've known me even longer than I have. But, uh, I mean, he, I think he really brought some things out that, that most most people just don't realize goes on all the time. I mean, you think about that. It, 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 you know, the, the, everybody, there's there's five couples in the, in yeah. the locker room that's having children and, and maybe a couple of them in its position group. And Michael Bennett spoke of this last week. You know, it's like, you know, you everybody's excited wives are excited you know and yeah and your child is the one that has the challenges and then you have to go to practice then you mm -hmm. have to get on a plane and go play a game and he just told you didn't play well you know and and, and so how do you prepare for that right yeah. but but that also defines and redefines and reshapes kind of your approach to your game now you know, you got some decisions to make because it's not about you. It's about your family. And that, like they mentioned, what are you really, truly willing to sacrifice? Um, and it's interesting, Kendall, because there's young men that and you'll, they'll sit there and they'll you watch the, the, the draft. You know, have, they're walking into this league with the same similar challenges. Right. And they haven't yeah. played down in the National Football League. Yeah, it, it couldn't be said any better. And then, you know, quite honestly, uh, that's what we talk about. That's the name of the show, Beyond the Game. It's not, you know, as, as we've said, the, the easiest time for most players is on the field when the clock's running. But when the clock stops, uh, the life keeps going, and it's people like yourself and uh, Dave Zodden and everybody else on, on the 32 teams that, that, that work on the player engagement, the player development um, that, that makes so much of a difference. So, you know, with that, um, Lamont, as always, appreciate you joining me. You are the OG. You're the godfather of this. And it's only because you simply wanted to make a difference and, and help people. And so I commend you. Thank you, Kendall. And I thank all of our listeners for, for giving us your time. Um, we appreciate you. Uh, and we hope that we're giving you a perspective uh, that give you more of an appreciation for uh, the teams that you support uh, and the players that you love. I thank you and uh, have a wonderful, wonderful week. That's awesome. He is Lamont Winston. I'm Kendall Gammon. We'll see you next time on Beyond the Game. <laughs>